Thank you very much. It was about um, four years ago that my wife said, um, your son is spending way too much time with the computer. Can you please go and do something about it? And I thought, well, that's like saying your son is spending way too much time with a dead tree when, in fact, he's reading a book. But I thought, OK, you know. If <laughs> but I thought, OK, if wife is telling me that, I better find out what it is that he's doing. And she probably achieved sort of the opposite of what she had hoped for, which was probably that I would pull him away from the computer. But instead, I got so fascinated with what was going on there that I actually spent the next few years making this pretty much the focus of my work. <laughs> so what was it that he and his friends were doing? They were all sitting on their computers, usually have headsets on, and they were all meeting in these virtual spaces. They were getting together in these virtual spaces with their computers, doing really interesting things. They were playing games like multi-user games like World of Warcraft and those kinds of things. And the funny thing is actually, even if they were getting together physically in the same room, they still all had their own computers and their headsets, and they were still sort of meeting you know, in parallel in these virtual spaces. So I thought it was really, really fascinating. But that was not the only thing. Then I was thinking, OK, uh, what is it that these guys are doing? And then it got really interesting. Because what these guys were doing was pretty complex stuff, complex and sophisticated stuff. They had like teams of 30 or 40 people getting together in these virtual spaces to do things like doing a raid, planning and executing a raid on another city in these virtual, in these fantasy worlds. And in order to do that, they had actually a very diversified team. There were you know, kids like my son, who was 10 years old at the time, um, and all the way up to adults, as you could hear from their rather adult language. And in fact, my son had to, he had to pretend to be somebody much older because he had to interview for his space on this team. So what was going on there was, was pretty interesting, but also the way they were doing it. So they had all these complicated tools up there. They were very quickly switching and juggling back between these different windows. They were using live voice. Uh, they were quickly looking at maps to get the context overview and going back and forth. So just watching this made me dizzy. And this is where, these were like 10-year-old kids doing this kind of stuff. So I thought, you know, that's pretty amazing stuff that you're doing there. So I asked my son, well, how many manuals did you read in order to learn that? It's really complicated. Do you guys have like formal training sessions to learn how to use this kind of thing? <laughs> and he laughed at me in saying, you know, manuals? No, we, we don't read manuals. Um, what we do is we, we go and explore these worlds in small teams with my friends. I'm there with my friends and we're finding out, you know, what's going on there by going through these spaces. Um, I'm learning from my friends, they might know more about this. I'm sometimes asking strangers, and he pointed at this exotic looking creature there. <laughs> so I realized what these guys were doing was pretty powerful. They were not learning the traditional way that I was used from the corporate space, but they were learning by all these means, in particular by doing actually. So this was a very interesting experience. And then I thought, okay, I've been working uh, most of my life in the corporate space. So I said, okay, what's going on in the corporate space? Because obviously, you know, something like what I've seen with the kids, any corporation would dream of doing that. You know, doing 30, 40 people, global collaboration, doing really sophisticated missions. What was on going on in the corporate space is this kind of thing. You have audio conference calls, and probably, you know, maybe the only person paying attention there is actually the speaker. <laughs> you, have these, uh, you have these webcasts, and all you see there is that, you know, people are supposed to be online, but you don't really know if they're paying attention to this. You know, not this level of engagement and immersiveness that I could see when these kids were playing. And yes, maybe you have one of those really sophisticated and expensive uh, video conferences. But even there, you cannot just say, well, let's get up and let's go to this other room or actually let's play a little game together to do something. So all of these corporate communication methods are actually very limiting. Uh, so what I then did, I thought about, okay, how could we use those kinds of mechanisms to apply them to the corporate world? And one of the projects I did was to create a nutrition seminar in this 3D space. And what we did there is we had a real-time community to get people to know how to eat healthier. But in fact, not only that, but to change their behavior. And that was sort of the, the difficult thing that the doctors sort of doing that normally had. So we created uh, these very engaging 3D multiplayer, you know, the same thing like the kids' environments, where people were attending these presentations. But even there, you can see from these, these props, these falling brand flags that came down there, even that was more engaging. And then actually they sat down and they played games. So they were sitting down in this interactive diner there to go through food choices during the day, to learn about balanced diet and all those kinds of things. 
And this was really successful. So people actually learned a lot. They changed the behavior. Actually, they lost more weight after having been through this than through the traditional way of doing that. Another thing I did was for large globally distributed corporations, they have challenges, particularly if they want to avoid travel and the carbon emissions and so forth. How could they do things like learning about value-based decision making, for example? So what we did is we created games where people play these games and that, uh, that makes them learn about you know, those kinds of principles. Or they were sitting after having played a game, they had learned about that there are different personality types. So they're sitting around this fire there, and engraved in these chairs is their personality type. And so they were basically playing games and collaborating in these virtual spaces, and we had the same effect with the kids. Once they had headphones on, they were sort of in this virtual world. And of course, you know, we saved all the travel. Not only that, we actually managed to address some of the, uh, the cultural and language issues that you have if you're trying to get five or six uh, countries in Asia to work together on this kind of thing. So that was pretty successful. But then I thought, okay, let me look back at what these kids are doing when they're not playing these games, how, they are, how they're learning in, sort of, you know, in their normal life. And um, I read a book called Learning in 3D, which has this wonderful little story. There's a family in the United States, in North Carolina, and they're visiting an old village from English settlement from, I think, 1587. So they're going, the kids and their parents are going through this village, and the kids you know, don't understand a lot of this stuff. So the parents have to explain what a blacksmith does, for example. The parents have to say that you had to take a sheep's clothes to make wool and then you could get clothes because you couldn't, you couldn't just buy them. And you had to bake bread before you can eat it because you know, there was no supermarket. But then the kids come to this, this next room and they're saying, we, we know what this is. This is a classroom. And of course, you know, nothing has really changed between many hundred years ago. Classrooms still through the century look pretty much like they used to look you know, in ancient times. And not only that, even modern classrooms sort of look this. And actually, normally, uh, people don't pay as much attention as you see on this picture here. So maybe you have sort of electronic whiteboard on this kind of thing. But in essence, the style of teaching and learning is still very much one person of authority, you know, usually talking down to a bunch of students. Uh, and there is very you know, little of, of dialogue. Another limitation that these physical classrooms have, of course, is that you might not have the kind of access that you would like. For example, if you're trying to teach Mandarin, you know, you might not have access to a native Mandarin speaker unless, you know, you're in a big city, you're in a rich school and you can afford to hire a few Mandarin teachers. So there are all these limitations in terms of style and certainly, you know, again, you don't find the same immersiveness uh, that you find there. And then I thought, okay, with all this technology, with, you know, broadband and computers and having all these games, surely there must be some pretty interesting stuff happening in an online education. But even there, actually, I got pretty disappointed because what I found is there's sort of three different types of online education. One is where you have a computer and a student. And there's not, you know, there's no real life human being in otherwise. It's just computer-based training. And that's, you know, A, it's very expensive to develop, but that's not that engaging because this human element really is missing there. Another thing that you have is you might find a broadcast of a teacher with a whiteboard. Um, and that's sort of nice for certain things. But, you know, it's fairly limiting. I cannot say I have a question you can't really interrupt. It's sort of running at its own pace. I can't ask my friends, you know, what do you think? Can you help me solve this? Because, you know, we're not together in the same space, really. It's, a, it's an insulated, you know, lonely experience. And the third one is where, in fact, you do have people in. So that technology is being used to get people into the space. And usually what you see, you see somebody's face. You have a little video conference. If you're lucky, you have a little whiteboard on that. And that's also fairly limited. It's usually one-on-one, -on -one, you know, this kind of video conference. And, you know, having seen those kids playing those games, this really is not, you know, as engaging as that kind of thing. So really, very little has changed um, over the years. It's pretty much still traditional classroom teaching that's happening. And even technology is not that much more than the classroom and the browser, really. So then we looked around, okay, how many, you know, kids are playing these kinds of things. And obviously, almost everybody of that age group is in these multi-user games. But not only that, you find users using not just the games, but these virtual world environments. At the beginning of 2009, we found more than 400 million using, and that's in addition to the games, people using these kinds of social environments. And then at the end, just in 21 months, in seven quarters, it's more than a billion 
users. So that's a million new users per day using these three, 3D environments. And most interestingly, of course, 75% of those are between 10 and 25 years old. So that young generation is not just using the internet, it's using these multiplayer, these virtual environments a lot. So if you then look at statistics, it's even more interesting because the majority of those users are between 10 and 15, and then 15 to 25, and that currently adds up to 800 million users being in that age group, and that's of course is still, still growing very aggressively. So having seen that, we thought, okay, you know, what happens if we would put these different elements together? If we take the multi-user environment, the avatars, if we take some of the engagement, the immersiveness we've seen, uh, which, you know, if it works in the adult work and the grown-up work, it certainly works with these, with these kids. And what happens actually if we take some of these games elements and put, we put them into, into a 3D avatar school? So this is what we started in Hong Kong some time ago. And basically what it is, sort of three components. One, we're putting human beings back in. We're putting a good teacher into this environment. And we're working with small groups of students and with teachers. Small groups is also important because that makes it much more interesting than working by yourself. The second thing is we're creating engaging 3D, very immersive uh, experiences for learning. And the third one is we're putting game elements and storytelling narratives into this element. So what we get is fun, because that actually is what happens in learning in games, in these multi-user games. The kids don't realize they're learning something, they're actually having fun, and that's sort of the ideal, I think. So let's look at these, what's happening if you put live teachers and small groups in. These are actually photos we took uh, during one of the tests with one of the Hong Kong uh, schools here. And we had a real life um, Mandarin class going on at the side with a great teacher. But even there, you could see, you know, these are eight or 10 years old. They were a little distracted, uh, they're fidgeting around, you know, even there, you didn't have the immersiveness that you would like to have as a teacher. And then once we took these kids and put them into the virtual space, as soon as they had headsets on and they were in this game, you see their faces. They were totally immersed in this. They were oblivious to any of their surroundings. You know, you really had their attention. And then when this boy realized that the avatar he was talking to was actually another human being, then his face really lit off. So just, you know, the fact that they were together as, as human beings there was fascinating. What was interesting also, what did not matter, because it didn't matter that you couldn't see somebody's real face, that they could just see the avatar representation. And that's interesting because particularly for young people, often, you know, you might be insecure about your appearance. Often seeing the real person actually doesn't add so much. It distracts from what can be done. So that was really fascinating how that worked. And of course, you know, not really surprising because, you know, kids, kids do that all the time. And then what we did is we took subjects, say language, for example, and we analyzed uh, what sort of teaching challenges you have. And in language, for example, you have one of the challenges you learn vocabulary. You memorize it and so forth. Another one is you have to learn grammatical concepts. And the third one might be, which actually is important, to practice these things in conversation. And often, particularly what in language, what happens is you're learning too much grammatical concepts, but you get very little opportunity to practice that with native speakers. So we created a series of these engaging, three-dimensional, multi-user learning experiences that make things fun. So what you see here, for example, this is a little board game, a trivial pursuit, and the teacher throws the dice, the student then has to proceed a number of fields, lens on blue here, and then gets a challenge with a timer, so there's competition and time pressure built in because that's what people like, and then has to solve this Chinese problem. Now if that person, it's multi-user, remember, so if this person doesn't get the answers, the other kids as avatars are saying, I know the answer, I know the answer, and then if this kid has done really well, the teacher gives him or her as a reward a little jellyfish. So there is this cute little blue jellyfish floating next to you, and you're really proud that you got one jellyfish, and the other kids want to get some jellyfish too. So you have this competition going on, which you know, comes very natural to humans in general and certainly to kids. And then the third thing that we're doing, we're taking those things, and we actually don't call them lessons, we call them episodes. And this is almost like a, um, like a TV series. And we create these role-playing environments where people can practice, you know, taking vegetables and fruits and so forth. And so that's what we did. We put teachers, human people back in, groups of students, created these engaging multi-user environments and put game elements and overarching narratives and linkages between the episodes on. And let's see how that looks like. So here we have a kid being totally in this world. And there we have the teacher throwing the dice and then the kid you know, proceeds for 
steps here. It's like being Alice in Wonderland. You don't move figures, but you are one of those figures playing that, and that really brings the fun. And then, you know, she gets there, she gets the challenge, she has to explain this in Chinese. The teacher here is also using the same, you know, interface and is explaining, is helping. So it really like, feels like being, like in a game, being with multiple kids and teachers. And of course, this teacher could be a native Mandarin speaker from, from China. It could be, you know, an English teacher from the Philippines. There you see the jellyfish being awarded. The goal here is to have multiple of those, for each one of those challenges, the different levels, uh, jellyfish. And once you have that, then you get, you know, the group award. And this is, you know, the kids from Los Angeles, we tested it, they really liked it. So you had, you know, total immersion. Here you had another example um, where you go and you learned about clothing items, which is one of the things you learn when you learn Mandarin. But here you can go in, you practice a little bit of that, and then you actually get to bargain and to role play different roles in a Chinese shop to, you know, to bargain for, for tennis shoes or for a t-shirt or other things. So you learn, you know, money, pronunciation. So it's a very engaging, lively environment with all the benefits for, you know, the teachers, they have more engagement. The students, of course, just, you know, absolutely love that. And um, the parents, I think, also like it because it's finally, you know, they're playing a video game, but, you know, it's for a good purpose and they're actually learning something. So that's pretty much what, um, what we did. Thanks very much. <laughs>